Hi, so today I'm going to do an allegorical understanding of Revelation 1, the, from the King James Version. I would like to preface this subject by saying that in many instances this account will only scratch the surface of the information available on this topic. I have cross-referenced several sources and then teamed that published knowledge with my own um, God-led insights and understandings. I do not profess to have all of the answers. I have merely endeavoured to give the fairest and most substantiated analysis possible. So I recently had a profound awakening and my awakening is a glorious gift from God because what I saw and felt during this awakening has it's just changed me. It's produced tangible and significant um, changes in all aspects of my life. Um, literally been saved. So I hope that you enjoy this um, and I hope that the glory of God blesses you in the same way that it has done for me. I will be using the King James um, Version as a point of reference because it does tend to be the most popular translation among Christians. I do however believe it necessary to say that the King James version of the Bible is not original text um, and that many of the Bible stories themselves are not original but rather they are evolutions of predated tales. Um, for example the Sumerian Great Flood in the Hebrew language, each letter possesses a numerical value. This is known as gematria. It is the calculation of the numerical equivalents of letters and words that helps us in gain insight um, into the interrelation of literal and symbolic Bible perception. It is for this reason that I will also be referencing gematria. A brilliant and comprehensive timeline of how the Bible ended up in its present day form can be found at www.thegreatsite.com. They have not endorsed me, by the way. Um, but for this presentation, I have outlined the main events. Okay, so in 1400 BC, the first written word of God as we understand it. Um, the Ten Commandments were delivered to Moses and since there was no written language at this time, only hieroglyphics and pictographs, Moses is thought to have shared um, the commandments verbally. Um, and the stone tablets that we see in um, Exodus symbolize the redemption from our senses and a solid foundation to base our freedom on. Um, and then in 1000 BC, the first written languages were invented such as Paleo-Hebrew. Um, and Moses' stories, among others, were recorded by um, cross-referencing the versions uh, that were heard from village to village and this technique was called oral tradition. Okay, um, and in 500 BC all of the original Hebrew manuscripts which make up the 39 books of the Old Testament were completed and in 200 BC the Septuagint, the Greek translation manuscripts, which contain the 39 Old Testament books and the 14 Apocrypha books um, was completed. And then in the first century AD, the Greek manuscripts, which now make up the 27 books of the New Testament were completed. Um, in 382 AD, we have the Latin Vulgate translation 
um, which was produced containing all of the 80 books. So 39 Old Testament, 14 Apocrypha books and 27 New Testament. And then in 995 AD, the Anglo-Saxon English version of the New Testament was produced. And in 1384, Wycliffe produced the first English version that included all 80 books. And in 1568, the Bishop's Bible was printed. And that was the Bible that King James made a version of. And in 1611, the King James Bible was printed. These first King James printed Bibles were the catalyst for a social movement because it was the first time that this knowledge had been made widely available. Interestingly, um, I've made some observations about this original King James Version. Um, the first illustrations um, in those early versions show the sun, Ra, and the moon, To, and in Paleo-Hebrew numerically, two is 46, and we have 46 chromosomes in each of our human cells. They also showed the tetrahedron, the horned Moses, and the pelican feeding its young. Hmm. 1603 to 1625 even show uh, illustrations of King James with a scepter and orb. Now, the purpose of this presentation is not to discredit King James or his version of the Bible, but it is worth noting that King James was influenced considerably by Francis Bacon, who famously said, the job of the artist is always to deepen the mystery and that many scholars have even pointed to Francis Bacon as being the actual writer of this version and some Shakespearean works. So um, the presentation is to just offer one possible allegorical meaning for Revelation 1. Um, as it is written in Galatians 4.24, which all things are symbolic, allegorical, meaning that the scriptures explain one thing as another. Um, now, I personally love the idea of a literal Bible and the brilliance of the Bible's literacy shows that the text does, in many instances, work both ways. As to why the scriptures are written symbolically and allegorically, the Bible does answer that question too. In the book of Matthew, he asks Jesus, um, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus said, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given and he will have abundance, but whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing, they do not see, and hearing, they do not hear, nor do they understand, and in them, the prophecy of Isaiah, is fulfilled which says hearing you will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see but not perceive for the hearts of this people have grown dull their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they do see, and your ears, for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and do not see it, and to hear what you hear, but do not hear it. I love that verse. So 
On that incredible note, uh, let's get started with the analysis of Revelations 1. Verses 1 and 2 say, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Okay, so in a literal sense, John receives a vision of Jesus Christ, Prince of Peace, that he is told to share with his servants. Uh, Let's look at the allegorical explanations for each component. So first we have John. Um, Now the name John is from the Hebrew Yohanan, meaning Yahweh is gracious, grace and mercy of the Lord, dove-like, meekness, compassion, fruitfulness, love. John's character is highly evolved spiritually and embodies everything that his name means. Therefore, his, he signifies a high intellectual perception um, of truth, a high consciousness, one that is eager for the rule of spirit. John is our innate inner consciousness that drives us to do right. Um, a revelation is an unveiling or disclosure of the truth, um, making known that which is hidden, and God. The name for God in the Hebrew Bible is Y-H-W-H, commonly pronounced Yahweh, um, and hebraically spelled yod Hey wah meaning I am who I am. Um... The name for God in the Greek Bible translation, the Septuagint, is Lord, to which the central O and R uh, means light. The modern word for God um, comes directly from the Old English word God, which literally means good. Um, God is the Almighty One the creator, the ruler of the universe, the infinite, the eternal, the underlying, unchangeable truth. Um, Jesus Christ. So the name for Jesus Christ in the Hebrew Bible is Yeshua, um, relating to the Hebrew verb root, vz, meaning rescue or deliver. The name Christ um, comes from the Hebrew word masiach, meaning anoint or smear with oil. Uh, Jesus Christ is the perfect expression of God as a man and a rescuing oil. Now, according to George W. Carey, all primitive Christians, the Essenes, fully realised and taught the great truth that Christ was a substance, an oil or anointment contained especially in the spinal cord and subsequently in all parts of the body, as every nerve in the body is directly or indirectly connected with the wonderful river that flows out of Eden, the upper brain, to the water garden. Okay, so my breakdown for verses one and two is this. Our higher conscience receives divine truths from the ruler of the universe via a rescuing oil. Okay, let's move on to verses 3 and 4. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, Grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before the throne. Okay, so 
literally um, and symbolically, uh, verse 3 just tells us how blessed we are to read this book um, and to understand the information for the time um, is close. Um, and in verse 4, we have John again, our higher conscience, um, addressing the seven churches of Asia. So uh, let's look at the seven churches of Asia. Asia. The importance of seven, hepta, corresponds to the Hebrew term Sheba or Saba, which means to be full or abundant. So seven is the number of completion or perfection. Now, I won't list all of the times that seven occurs in the Bible because as you probably know, it is mentioned a lot. Now, for the churches. So each one was striving for perfection, but failing in a specific area much like the way in which we try to overcome challenges um, and pitfalls on a personal level and we struggle with attachments, denial, grief, conflict, etc. So each church represents um, one of the seven energy centres of the body um, and the emotional faculty, faculty that must be aligned with God for us to reach um, that level of perfection. So the first church is uh, euphius, um, meaning desirable, um, the consciousness of desire, the root chakra or gonad gland. The second church is smyrna, I think I've said that right, meaning flowing or distilling. Um, it's the sacral chakra or the linden gland. Um, the third church is Pergamum, Pergamum, uh, strongly united and elevated, that means. Um, so that is our solar plexus um, or our adrenal glands. Uh, then we have church four, Thyatira, um, meaning rushing headlong. Um, so that's our enthusiasm, our zeal, our love um, in our heart chakra or our thymus gland. Um, and then we have church five, sardis, um, which means precious stone, so riches, um, and carnelian, the colour purple, which stands for power. Um, and our power is in our throat chakra or our thyroid gland because that's where, you know, we speak our truth, hopefully, if, if we're not bound by chains of bondage, fear, doubts, etc. Um, and then we have church six, which is Philadelphia, um, which means brotherly love, unconditional. Now this is our third eye chakra or um, our pituitary gland. Um, and then we have finally Laodicea, um, which means justice um, or judgment and that is our crown chakra um, or our pineal gland. Then we have the second half of verse 4 which says and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So since the churches pertain to the seven physical parts of the energy centers of the body, the seven spirits pertain to the ethereal body or esse that flows through the energy centers and this can be cross-referenced to Romans uh, 12, 6 to 8. The Holy Spirit manifests in mankind through these graces, reflecting the seven spirits of Yahweh. The seven graces are one, insight, which is prophecy, two, helpfulness, which is service or ministry, three, instruction which is teaching, four encouragement or exhortation, five generosity giving, six which is guidance or leaderships and seven compassion, empathy, all of those things. Um, it is the nurture and development of these seven spirits that leads us before the throne 
Now, to be before the throne means to be in a high state of consciousness and good judgment. Um, good judgment reveals our limitless potential for pure thought and creation. Okay, so the breakdown of verses three and four. Our higher conscience addresses our seven physical and spiritual energy centers, offering them peace from the ruler of the universe. Okay, so let's go on to verses five and six. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Okay, so in verse 5, we have the rescuing oil, who is a loyal witness, something to be trusted, and the first begotten of the dead. Now, begotten of the dead means um, firstborn of the spirit, which pertains to the Christ seed um, that is born in Bethlehem, uh, house of bread or our solar plexus. When this rescuing oil, commonly known as the sacred secretion, travels down the spine or the river Jordan to the solar plexus, it combines with our breath. Um, now, it, breath is mean, Holy Spirit means breath or pneumo ruash and that that's how the seed is produced um and then we go on um and the king and the prince of kings of the earth the perfect expression of god um and washed baptized cleansed us from our sins or shortcomings in his blood blood Okay, so the blood of Christ expresses a spiritual principle that purifies the mind and heals the body, just as the physical person of Jesus gave the entire population a transfusion of new blood or life when he died on the cross. The Christ oil, rescuing oil or sacred secretion, gives us a physiological blood transfusion as well. The ponds raises the preserved, refined and transmuted oil into the optic thalamus where new blood is produced and dormant brain cells are activated. Um, in Leviticus 17.11 we are told the life of flesh is in the blood. Okay, moving on to verse 6. And hath made us kings and priests, this means righteously guided and governed by spirit. Um, and then unto God and his father, so by the ruler of the universe, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Uh, which basically means be thankful for this revelation and give it authority over yourself. Amen. Now, amen or om, m is literally the on switch um, between the physical and spiritual realms, but I can't get into that right now because it's massive. Okay, so the breakdown. Um, the rescuing oil is a trusted, God-born expression of perfection that cleanses our spirit via the blood, making us righteously governed by the ruler of the universe whom we should be thankful to and give authority to. Amen. Okay, moving on to verses 7 and 8. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall hear him, and they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so. Amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Okay, so verse 7, Beholdeth he cometh with the clouds. 
Um, so God's ideas basically come to us in into our spirit, in spirit. And every eye shall see him. This means that God's ideas become manifested by human means, by us. Um, and they also who pierced him. That those of us who are destroying the Christ oil, pretty much everyone, through um, evil or lower thoughts and behaviours. Um, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. This means that the rescuing oil, when you realise this, it, it's, it's going to make you surrender, which is going to make you cry, amen. And then self, uh, verse 8 is self-explanatory, it just means I am the infinite light and power. Okay, so the breakdown for verses 7 and 8. Every being will come to know the rescuing oil and it will make them cry in awe and disbelief. For I am the infinite light and power. Amen. Whew. Okay, moving on. Verses 9 and 10. John, I, John, sorry, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom of patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So according to George W. Carey, the I stands for all, the eternal I. Um, and the Bible hub tells us that Ani is the Hebrew word for I and Ani comes from Anoki, which literally means myself. So we have I, John, or my higher consciousness, uh, consciousness, um, who also am your brother, which is an established thought, um, and companion in tribulation. Now that's a friend in time of trouble. Um, and then the next verse is, and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. So the kingdom. Well, Luke 17, 21 says, For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Showing us once again that this patience, this inner calmness, this quiet endurance, this power of Jesus is residing within our bodies as a rescuing oil. Um, and then we go into, was in the isle that is called Patmos. Patmos is the island to which John was banished um, and it was there that John received his vision. So Patmos um, is a place within consciousness that we realise through spirit that fleshly or carnal man produces nothing. Patno Patmos means mortal. Um, and that's taken from the metaphysical dictionary at truthunity.net. For the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Since we know that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God, John 1.1, 1, 1, it is safe to say that our higher consciousness, John, should surrender to our mortal Patmos thoughts for the word of God, light of creation, and for the testimony or personal experience of Jesus Christ rescuing oil. Okay, moving on to verse 10. Um, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day so the Lord's Day, or the Light of Creation's Day, is the Day of Understanding or Illumination. Days um, and nights symbolise degrees of enlightenment. Um, night being ignorance and day being understanding. Um, and let's go on. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. So the Christ oil we know travels behind us because our spinal cord is in our back. Um, and the trumpet 
is the harmonious waves of energy um, that we hear once it's traveled to every part of our body via the mind. Um, and since this is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the trumpet signifies the voice of Jesus's Holy Spirit. Okay, so the breakdown of verses 9 and 10. My higher consciousness and established thoughts are a friend in times of trouble. Within myself and my inner calmness, I should surrender all mortal thoughts for the light of creation. To personally experience the benefits of the rescuing oil. I was in a state of understanding and illumination and heard the ruler of the universe loud and clear. Wow, okay, verses 11 and 12. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Euphius and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. Whew. Okay, verse 11. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. So we know this means I am infinite. Um, and what thou seest, what I am showing you, write it in a book. This could be literal or it could just mean remember it um, and send it to the seven churches which in, are in Asia. Now we've been through these once but I'm going to go through them again to explain which um, blocks each one. Okay, so Ephesus is concerned with survival and it gets blocked by fear. Um, that's our root chakra gonad gland in the coccyx. Um, the church or part of us that has forsaken its true love. Okay, then we have Smyrna, uh, which is concerned by pleasure, um, but it gets blocked by guilt. Um, that's in our sacral chakra or linden gland in the lower abdomen. Um, and that is the church or part of us that suffers persecution. Um, okay, then we have Pergamum, which is concerned with willpower, but it gets blocked by shame, disappointments, knockbacks. Um, that's our solar plexus chakra in our adrenal glands and that's the church or part of us that needs to repent. Then we have um, Thyatira concerned with love and blocked by grief. It's the heart chakra, heartbreak, thymus gland, the church or part of us that has false prophets. Then we have Sardis this is concerned with truth um, and is blocked by lies, not only lies that we say, but lies that are told to us and, you know, lies that we've understood since birth. And that is our throat chakra, our thyroid gland. And that church is the part of us that's fallen asleep and ceased to express its truth. Then we have Philadelphia, which is concerned with insight, but it gets blocked by illusions. Um, it's our brow chakra, our pituitary gland, the church or part of us that has endured patiently. Um, we all know what that's like. And then we have Laodicea, which is concerned with thought and blocked by attachments to earthly or mortal things um, and beliefs. It's the crown chakra, the pineal gland. It's where Jacob met God. Um, and it's the church or part of us which has just become insipid to God or lukewarm. And, you know, that can be because of the physical aspects of calcification in our diets and, you know, the pro 
the overproduced, not overproduced, what's the word I'm looking for, the overprocessed foods and water that we're being given, but it also becomes lukewarm due to, you know, the the blockages in the other six um, centres that I mentioned before this, because, you know, if you are feeling guilt or disappointment or heartbreak, grief, then, you know, you're not really going to feel particularly compelled to condition this spinal energy center or to um, nourish this spinal church, you know. So it's really important to address all of these problems, you know, from the root up um, to to have like a thorough cleansing. Um, Okay, let's go on and look at the candlesticks. Candlesticks. Okay, so the candlestick of the temple, which was the body, in Exodus 25.31 represents the intelligence of man. So the seven golden candlesticks are they're receptacles of spiritual light. Um, they're our ethereal body. Um, they're the spiritual aspect of the seven churches. Um, the spiritual wisdom and understanding side of the churches Um, and that's from the metaphysical dictionary at truth unity so then we have verse 12 and i turned to see the voice that spake with me so i turned and i saw jesus and being turned i saw the seven golden candlesticks so as i turned i saw seven energy centers or chakras okay so The breakdown of verses 11 and 12 is this. The ruler of the universe said, I am infinite. Remember what I am showing you and address the blockages of your energy centers. I turned around and saw the seven chakras. Okay, let's move on to verses 13 and 14. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Okay, so 13, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, so surrounding the seven energy centers, one like the Son of Man. Okay, so according to the Metaphysical Dictionary, the meaning of Son of Man is that within us which discerns the difference between truth and error. When we get this understanding, we are in a position to free our soul from sin and to free our body from disease. Clothed with a garment down to the foot, this is symbolizing ascension or royalty um, and girt. Now girt is from the past participle gird, which is a belt or a band. Um, about the paps. So the first interpretation for paps explains um, where it was on the body. Um, Paps means nipples, so the belt or band uh, was around the chest area. Now, the second interpretation to consider here is, are you ready for this? Three, phosphoadenosine and five, phosphosulfate, known as PAPS, P-A-P-S. It is the common coenzyme in sulfo transfer acid reactions, a coenzyme is a non-protein chemical compound or metallic ion that is required uh, for enzyme activity. These 
are often referred to as helper molecules and they assist in biochemical transformation. Um, okay, so within a golden girdle, this pertains to the increase in strength, truth um, and consciousness that is flowing from and protecting the breast or heart. Okay, so then we have verse 14. His head and his hairs were white like wool. And um, this means that his thoughts um, were of substance. Um, they were pure and multiplied. Um, and they were as white as snow, which um, is clear and pure. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. That means they were purified and manifested eternal life. Okay, so the breakdown of 13 and 14. And encompassing the seven energy centers was the knowledge of truth and error, wrapped in royal power and strength that protected his heart. His thoughts were pure and multiplied, and his vision was purified in eternal life. Okay, verses 15 and 16. And his feet like unto fine brass, and if, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth, in his strength. Okay, so his feet like fine brass. Well, feet are our connection um, between the physical and spiritual worlds. Um, for example, the washing of the feet um, is it symbolizes the cleansing of physical or carnal attachments. Um, and brass is from the Greek word chalco chalco libyan now chalco is a compound of copper and zinc and libanon means frankincense so let's just have a quick look at copper copper helps the body to form red blood cells um, now we know that the life of the body is in the blood whilst keeping the blood vessels nerves tree of life immune system and bones healthy Copper is one of the most electrically conductive metals. Now that symbolizes the strength of Jesus's bioelectrical aura. By wearing copper, um, it helps the body to kill bacteria, it reduces inflammation, it amplifies our energy and it balances our seven energy centers churches candlesticks um, and then we have zinc now zinc is found in cells throughout the body um, it is needed for our immune system to function it also helps with cell division and production um, healing and the breakdown of carbohydrates um, then we have frankincense um, a fragrant gum resin. Uh, it represents in man the transmutation um, of the material, physical consciousness into spiritual. Um, as if they burned in a furnace, as if they were on fire, um, and his voice as the sound of many waters. The term used to describe Jesus' voice of many waters is the same in Ezekiel 43.2 and in the seventh chapter of Daniel. So, water symbolises many things, um, but in these instances, I believe that Jesus' voice was purifying, um, like baptismal waters. And 16... And he had in his right hand seven stars. This um, could be referencing the seven stars of Pleiades that Job 38 speaks of. The sweet influence 
the sweet influences of Pleiades. So Pleiades in Greek um, legends, the seven stars of Pleiades um, on Taurus's shoulder were linked to Artemis and that was the goddess of vitality um, and sustenance in all life forms. And the truth, uh, the metaphysical dictionary at Truth Unity says Pleiades, uh, Pleiades, Greek, the seven stars, seven daughters of Atlas, heap, cluster, bound together, family, much more, abundance, increase, multitude, superior, more excellent, and perfect. So since stars metaphysically represent truth and light, and seven represents perfection, this part of the scripture could just mean the perfect amount of truth and light. Okay, and then we have the verse, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. So the mouth is a mean of expressing oneself, um, our heart, expressing our heart and our thoughts and our loves. Um, and the two-edged sword typifies the twofold power of denial and affirmation. One edge points towards the past and the other edge points towards the future. And the metaphysical dictionary at Truth Unity says, first it would cut backwards, which would free from any entanglements or clinging to the past. And the second movement of the sword would carve for you a very narrow pathway of truth into your future. Okay, so then we have the verse, and his countenance was the sun, was as the sun shineth in his strength. So countenance comes from countenance, meaning face or mood of, from the Hebrew exp expression panim, um, prosperon, meaning appearance or shape. And sun is the supreme source of light and spiritual intelligence, which is different to the moon, which uh, because the moon represents intellectual. So sun is spiritual, moon is intellectual. Um, I also love the translation that is offered of this on the Bible Hub. It says, the dazzling glory of him who is the sun of righteousness is intolerable to human eyes. Okay, so the breakdown of verses 15 and 16. And his connection between the physical and spiritual realms was healthy, amplified, and conscious. His voice was purifying. In his strong hand was the perfect amount of truth and light and from his mouth he expressed freedom from the past and truth in the future. His face showed pure spiritual intelligence. Okay, moving on. Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive for evermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Okay, so, and when I saw him, so when the rescuing oil revealed him, I fell at his feet. I surrendered, and he laid his right hand upon me. Um, he put his strong hand on me. Um, and said unto me, fear not, I am the first and the last. Well, he told me not to be afraid, for he is infinite. And I am he that liveth and was dead. This means I am the spirit. And behold, I am alive forevermore. I am eternal and I have the keys of hell and death. Okay, so... 
he has the answers to hell and death. So let's look at hell. Um, there are two words translated hell in the New Testament. One of those is Hades, which is Greek, and the other is Gehenna from the Hebrew words Gi and Hinnom, meaning the valley of Hinnom. Um, Gehenna is um, a place just outside of Jerusalem where the city's rubbish was burned. Um, it symbolises that purifying fire which consumes the darkness um, of man's character. Metaphysically, hell represents a corrective state of mind. When error has reached its limit, the retroactive law asserts itself um, and judgment being part of the law brings the penalty called hell upon the transgressor. This penalty is not punishment, but discipline. If the transgressor is repentant and obedient, he is forgiven. The common threat of eternity in hell, that must already be occurring um, because eternity is infinite. So um, it's without beginning um, or end. So hell must literally be here and now. Um, and the now is the only moment that we can actually use to increase the quality of our spirit. Um, okay, so Bill Donahue said hell. I am here to say on the authority of the Bible that there is no such physical place as hell and there is no devil. Devil is simply evil with a D at the beginning. And God says, that when we die, we become spirits anyway. And it's a physical impossibility for spirits to burn. So hell is a concentration that we make out of our own perceived agony. That's Buddha's um, definition. The composition of hell is fire and brimstone. And brimstone is sulfur. So fire is the spirit and brimstone is sulphur and the word sulphur literally means to burn and sulphur is inside every human being. Um, hell is a degree of consciousness within everyone. Okay, sulphur. It is number 16 on the periodic table. Uh, biblically there were 16 judges in Israel. Um, uh, it is yellow and it melts at 160 degrees. Sulfur dissolves other elements creating crystals, purifying them just like the fires of hell. Um, when sulfur and zinc are united, a large amount of energy is released, assisting the body's bioelectrical current and the preserving and raising of the rescuing oil or sacred secretion. The ancient Romans used sulfur to cure many skin conditions and this is actually still done today. It's the same as taking an Epsom bath. Um, sulfur is antibacterial and 100% natural. Sulfur is in onions, garlic, and broccoli. Interestingly, onion and banana juice is renowned for its ability to condition the respiratory system and control blood pressure, which in turn helps in, um, clear and enliven our seven energy centers, chakras or seals. Sulfur is one of the most abundant abundant miracles in the body, says Dr. Makola. The correct balance of sulfur, masculine energy, mercury, feminine, feminine energy, creates bioreactions that help to raise the sacred secretion. Sulfur helps our blood 
flow faster. This improves gland health. Um, and remember, there is a major gland at each energy center. Um, organ health um, and mineral metabolism. The whole body will be more balanced. Sulfur resonates energetically with the solar plexus, which is the adrenal glands, eradicating um, anything which does not furnish the body, mind and spirit. Hellfire, sulfur, is a place of purging, purifying and cleansing. It's a place where the fire burns through the lower aspect of your consciousness, burning up all of the things which attack you. Okay, let's look at death. Death from the word maveth, original word, unpronounceable. Um, death is not a friend, but an enemy and must be overcome. Death does not change man and bring him into the resurrection and eternal life. Death has no place in the absolute. The first death is the death of light and spirit in our consciousness. And the second death is the cessation of vital force and action in the body. Um, it occurs when the mind completely loses control of the body. The functional activities cease and the physical organism dissolves. Okay, so the breakdown. When the rescuing oil, sacred secretion, manifested, I surrendered. I felt the strong hand of the ruler of the universe on me and it told me not to be afraid for he is infinite. I am spirit, I am eternal and I have the answers to purification and eternal life. Okay, let's move on to verses 19 and 20. Write the things which thou have seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. Okay, so... <laughs> Write there things which thou hast seen, remember and record what you've seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be thereafter. Remember all of it. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, the perfected amount of truth and light that you saw in my strong hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, and the seven energy centers. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay, so let's look at angels. Angels in Hebrew is malach and is angelos in Greek. Both of those words pertain to something that acts decisively in fulfilling God's will in the physical world. In most biblical scenarios, angels are messengers declaring and promoting God's will. When angels are witnessed, the bearer always receives divine intelligence, intuition and understanding. Our physical bodies also receive messages, um, commonly known as messenger particles. Photons deliver messages to the body and they travel to the body on angles of light. 
A photon is a small unit of light energy. The Bible says that God is light in 1 John 1, 5 to 9. This is the message that we have heard and from him and declare to you, God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. When photons touch the skin, the body's cells absorb energy, which is beneficial to the body's health in several ways. For the body to absorb photon light, it requires direct exposure um, to the skin for its full effects to be received. This means exposure to the sun. Uh, because the sun is the source of photons. Let's just have a look at the book Astronomy, Astrophysics, Evolution and Earth Science. The energy produced by nuclear fusion is conveyed from the heart of the sun by light particles and heat called photons. This particle created in the solar core transmits the light beam to Earth. Uh, so, when photon light is absorbed by the body, it forms nitric oxide. Nitric oxide stimulates synthesis of adenosine um, triphosphate, ATP, which is essential for the metabolism of all cellular regeneration. Photon light therapy exists assists directly with mitochondria, the part of the cell that is responsible for generating proteins and collagen. The new cells destroy old cells and assist with purification. So, the breakdown. Oh, remember everything that I am showing you. The secret of the perfect amount of truth and light and the seven energy centers is that the perfect amount of truth and light are messenger particles, which are gifts from the body's energy centers. And the seven spiritual receptacles are also seven physical glands. Okay, so let's just quickly read the whole translation. One to two. Our higher conscience receives divine truths from the ruler of the universe via a rescuing oil. Our higher conscience addresses our seven physical and spiritual energy centers, offering them peace from the ruler of the universe five and six. The rescuing oil is a trusted, God-born expression of perfection that cleanses our spirit via the blood, making us righteously governed by the ruler of the universe, whom we should be thankful to and give authority to. Amen. Seven to eight. Every being will come to know of the rescuing oil and it will make them cry in awe and disbelief for I am the infinite light and power. Amen. 9 and 10. My higher consciousness and established thoughts are a friend in times of trouble. Within myself and my inner calmness I should surrender all mortal thoughts to the light of creation to personally experience the benefits of the rescuing oil. I was in a state of understanding or illumination and heard the ruler of the universe loud and clear. 11 and 12 the ruler of the universe said, I am infinite 
remember what I am showing you and address the blockages of your energy centers. I turned around and saw the seven chakras, 13 to 14, and encompassing the seven energy centers was the knowledge of truth and error, wrapped in royal power and strength that protected the heart. His thoughts were pure and multiplied, and his vision was purified in eternal life. 15 to 16. And his connection between the physical and spiritual realms was healthy, amplified and conscious. His voice was purifying. In his strong hand was the perfect amount of truth and light. And from his mouth he expressed freedom from the past and truth in the future. His face showed pure spiritual intelligence. 17 and 18. When the rescuing oil, sacred secretion manifested, I surrendered. I felt the strong hand of the ruler of the universe on me and it told me not to be afraid for he is infinite. I am spirit, I am eternal and I have the answers to purification and eternal life. 19 to 20, remember everything that I am showing you. The secret of the perfect amount of truth and light and the seven energy centers is that the perfect amount of truth and light are messenger particles which are gifts for the body's energy centers and the spiritual receptacles are also seven physical glands. Well, there we go. So I hope you liked it. Um, again, I'd just like to iterate. This isn't the finite word on it. I know that. I don't um, profess to think that it should be. Uh, it's just my interpretation and evaluation of everything, having sort of brought together everything that I know and have learned over the years um, and have, you know, researched and read. And yeah, I may try and do more. I'm not sure yet. I know that I felt really strongly that um, the Holy Spirit wanted me to do this one. So if you liked it, please do subscribe. Please leave your comments. Um, and yeah, I have some other videos on here. So check those out too. Thanks very much. Stay blessed.